Okay, we're back and we're live. Uh, impressions. Yeah, managers. they're learning facilitators. That's what we call them, learning facilitators. So are the teachers, uh, are they uh, able to take care of more students in the class? Because one of the major complaints is teachers have too many students within each class. Uh, 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 classroom size, as far as I know, has not been documented uh, to be associated with student achievement in any way, form, or fashion. You cannot produce, my understanding is, you know, I don't profess to be any kind of educational expert. My understanding is, is that when pressed, you cannot produce any data that show that classroom size is associated with student learning. It cannot be produced. Even in university settings, you know, where you have 600 people in the classroom and 20 people in the classroom, you cannot show uh, that, it's, that, it's, that that's related to it. Uh, distance learning, people that are down line tonight on a television screen or whatever, uh, Stanford University uh, did a big study of that, no difference at all. People don't learn down line anymore or any less than they do when they're sitting inside the classroom. You cannot show, as far as I know, you know, any, any correlation between those things. Now, there's something intuitively disturbing about that. You would like to think that if a student had one-on-one -on -one tutorial type of, uh, you know, training with the teacher or whatever, that they'd learn more. But uh, my understanding is the data don't bear that out. Uh, the, uh, they pass state laws based upon that, on that philosophy, that you can't have more than so many students uh, in a first grade class, et cetera, et cetera. We violated all those laws, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Zelia put, you know, 30, you know, two first graders in a class, and that's in violation of state law. But those 32 people didn't need to be in, uh, they, they could, those 32 kids could deal with a first grade class just fine. And so we had 16 kids in one class, or 12 in a class, or 18 in a class, depending on who needed to be in the class. So, you know, we, we made the decisions based on that, and we got in trouble for it. I say we, I mean, I have like a work leader, I didn't. But uh, I feel like I worked over there. But no, they, no they, they made those decisions, they ran with them. But I do not know of any study that could, uh, when, when, you're, when you're pressed, you know, uh, I don't think you can prove, uh, in fact, that it, that it is related. Uh, teacher training, by the way, is the number one variable uh, that uh, related to student achievement. That is, if, if, you know, if the teacher's been trained and they've gone and they've, um, you know, whatever, they go through training. That, that, my understanding is that could be documented to be associated with student achievement. Yeah. Has the system pushed back by now? Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll spend uh, some time talking about that. The system pushed back big time. You push on the system, the system will push back. She's been patient. It seems to me like there would be some resistance on the part of the parents because the parents went through the old system and uh, that resistance to change and accepting this. Not my experience at all. Parents love it. Parents embrace it. Uh, parents feel like they're valued partners. Uh, parents participate. Uh, no, hadn't been a problem at all. Parents. The only thing that the parents get upset about, and it, it's my experience has been, it's primarily with the country club set, uh, is this idea that you want every kid to be at grade, grade level. Uh, they want their kid to be number one in the class. Uh, they want their kid to learn, and they'd really like to be, there to be a good smattering of dummies in there to make their kid look smart. But that's a country club crowd. Uh, I haven't worked with the country club crowd, not very much. But that, that's where the pushback comes on that. Is it my kid? Well, I want my kid to be ranked number one in the class. See, and uh, and for that, I need a bunch of dummies in there to not learn. But that, that's the country club crowd, not the not the folks I work with. Where did, uh, where did Brandon Clark learn all about the quality? I mean, it just seemed like she was really on top of it, and that doesn't seem like something that was taught to her in the education system. No, she did, uh, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> at and Paradigm, she mentioned them uh, and Honeywell and uh, several other uh, companies over there in, in uh, Pinellas County, Florida Power and Light, uh, Florida Power Progress or whatever they're called, um, Florida Power Corp. Uh, several uh, businesses over there uh, got behind an initiative in 1991. Uh, that's how I got involved was I got a phone call from John Mitchum at AT&T Paradigm who asked me if I would go over there and kind of represent higher education uh, and participate in the deal. Of course, they all bailed out and I stayed. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, so they, they, they took the AT&T uh, training that was offered by AT&T Corp uh, and then basically brought it into the Pinellas County Schools. 
uh, when they did that, uh, and so there was, a, there was a kind of a volunteer cadre of people that kind of went through that training, uh, then that training was uh, uh, adapted over uh, into business, from business terminology over to education terminology. I spent probably three years of my life getting that done. Uh, Brenda showed up, my memory of it was, that Brenda showed up about the, end of, about the time we got all of that stuff uh, put together. And then there was a, we had a, a summer camp that people could go to, kind of an, uh, an indoctrination, three-day deal that people went to in the summer. Uh, Brenda signed up for that, and then she really ran with it. Um, I uh, have uh, done a lot of coaching with her. I've, I've given her stuff to read. I've hung around her. One of my doctoral students, uh, Karen Kennedy, worked over there for about five years, four years uh, working with them and uh, sharing our knowledge with her. I spent, I don't, I spent at least one day a week uh, for at least three years over there uh, at Azalea, a lot of times uh, spending hour after hour sitting at Brenda's desk uh, talking about, you know, what do we do about this? What are you going to do about that? You know, how should you look at this decision? How you look at that decision? You know, translating business stuff into, into school stuff. I learned from her. She learned from me. Uh, we, you know, we did a lot of sharing. Mark Blazy, uh, who does all the Baldrige training for examiners, is one of the leading experts in the country, took a personal interest in Azalea. Uh, and, and did some uh, did some things for her. Um, Jim Shipley, who ran the Quality Academy, is also a Baldrige examiner. And all. He spent a lot of time uh, over there with her. And she got a lot of help. When she asked for it, she got it. Mar uh, they mentioned E-Systems, E-Systems, Raytheon E-Systems, located right across the street uh, from the school. Uh, Lisa Dupre, uh, the, uh, I can't remember her boss's name now, Jim Hicks, uh, was, a, was also a, a participant in the, in the Quality Academy Advisory Board. Uh, the, you know, uh, and the, they, you know, when, when they, I don't, every time they asked for something, they got it, as far as I know. Every time. I don't, I never asked for anything that I didn't get. Uh, I was always, uh, so, somebody would come and give us what we needed. Uh, she got uh, basically fired. Uh, the, um, uh, I mean, it, it would be, it's, that's not, if the Pinellas County Schools were here, they'd, they'd find that, that comment very offensive. She was told, to either stop her national agenda or leave, so she left. The system pushed back. Hmm? Where did she go? Uh, she uh, goes around the country uh, doing private consulting work for uh, a school district. She's been offered the superintendent's job at several very large school districts around the United States, uh, state-level jobs around the United States. Uh, my guess is, is that she makes about a quarter of a million dollars a year now. They sentenced her to a life of uh, luxury and leisure. <laughs> Uh, the system pushed back. If you, if you, know, if you don't want to talk about the system pushing back, I'd be glad to talk about it. You know. What happened to the school? Uh, what happened to the school? Well, and what happened to the process? What happened to the district? What happened uh, to all the initiatives? Uh, it's still going on in Pinellas. Uh, you know, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the great um, sources of consternation is the extent to which it's going on at, in the district. Uh, that's one of the major battles. Uh, I'm persona non grata because I tell the truth. Uh, that you'll find the truth is a stranger in most governmental operations, and Pinellas is no different uh, than that. Uh, uh, if you take the data, you know, from Azalea, uh, and you plot it, and you know, here's uh, K uh, to five. That's when they're down at Azalea, and then here they hit middle school. Uh, that's uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth. You know, here's where they hit the ninth grade. We don't have data out here much, uh, but here's what this curve looks like. And it's just on a 45 degree angle as long as they're at Azalea. And then as soon as they hit the sixth grade, it just absolutely caps off. And then it depends on where they go to high school. It looks like it drops after that. There's absolutely no improvement whatsoever while they're down at the middle school. None. Absolutely nothing happens down there. Now, what, what, what you're going to find out is, is that, you know, the, they won't do anything about this. There's nowhere in Pinellas County School that you can start in kindergarten and be exposed to an integrated management system all the way until you get out of high school. Now, nobody has cracked the secondary model yet. In other words, uh, we don't, I know what an elementary system looks like because I worked on it for five years, six years. That, that system has been copied all over the country. I mean, we know what the elementary system looks like. Nobody knows what the, what the secondary system looks like. Uh, how do you create an integrated management system around, uh, around subject areas that, that coordinate with one another and all that? I, I, I think I know how to do it, but I'm not allowed to do it. Uh, the, uh, uh, I've, gone, I've offered, I don't know how many times, to work with any, uh, 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 any middle school or any high school that's willing to take on the project. Uh, I went out to, uh, uh, she mentioned what was going on in, uh, at Osceola High School, and what, a, what a wonderful thing was going on out there. Uh, you know, I went out there and offered, volunteered to give them five years of my life. 
You know, say, if you'll take on, if you'll take on this five-year commitment to build a world-class high school here, you know, that will be the role model for every high school in the United States in the same way that Azalea has become the role model for many, many, many elementary schools in the United States. Somebody told me that they printed off over a quarter of a million copies of their Sterling application already. You know, and it makes me feel good to know that a lot of schools around the, around the country have found value in that and are using that document. And I wanted to do the same thing for a secondary school. They said, no thanks. Actually, they're smarter than that. They didn't say no thanks. They just didn't say anything at all. What was their reasoning? Uh, uh, you know, they just, they got excuses. And, and, and I'm not demeaning their excuses. I mean, their excuses are valid excuses. Now, what do you do? What do you do when you have workers that I mean, I'm telling you that no, before the bell has stopped ringing, they're on their way to the car, you know, and they have absolutely no interest whatsoever in anything associated uh, with improvement. No interest whatsoever. None. What do you do? What do you do when you have a factory? What would you do if you had a factory and the workers in there just don't care? They have been beaten up. They have been demeaned. They have, they have seen systems come and go, improvement plans come and go. They have heard program of the month over and over again. Every day they, re they pick up the newspaper and they're being battered about in the newspaper, told how dumb they are, how bad they are, how poor the school is, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and it's, they're, they're, just not, they're not pumped up. And, and the system doesn't support it. I mean, you know, you just have to understand that you're fighting an uphill battle when you fight it. The whole way. It's an uphill battle all the way. So He's been, she's been very patient. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about how, when the program was very first started, how did they teach the children? I mean, they already have more than, as she said, more than their share of things to teach children. And I'll be first to say, I don't know anything about children. So, this is and, a good thing. <laughs> I just wonder how you teach a kindergartner or a first grader what continuous improvement is. Half of them probably can't say it. Oh yeah, they can. It's, uh, what's amazing about a young child uh, is, is that their mind hasn't been warped yet. See? And so it's like trying to change you guys, forget it. Uh, you know, you're, you're uh, you know uh, with a, with a, with a eight, you know, with a, with a six, seven, eight year old kid, you'd be amazed at what, you, if you just, you, if you don't tell them that they can't do that, they just, they just believe it. I mean, the Sterling examiners, when they went to, uh, went to Rawlings Elementary School, uh, you know, we've had Rawlings come in too. I could have gotten Rawlings to come in just as well as Azalea. Uh, uh, I worked with both those schools. Both those schools won the Sterling Award. You know, I'm very proud of that. that that's one of, my, one of the things I'm most proud of in my whole life, actually, is working with both those schools. And R Rawlings, when, they, when, the, when Azalea went in, I'm, I'm sorry, when the examiners went in to Rawlings, they went into a first grade class. And they walked in, and the exam we thought that the examiners were only going to talk to the faculty and staff. <laughs> you know, we didn't. We never thought they'd talk to the kids. <laughs> and so we, we prepped the faculty and the staff. You know, here's what's going to happen. You've got these examiners coming in. Here are the kind of questions they're going to ask you, et cetera, et cetera. We had kind of prepped everybody for the side visit. But the kids didn't know that Sterling was coming in. They had no idea what Sterling was. You know, so the first thing they did was headed straight for the classrooms. <laughs> and so the, these examiners walk in this first grade classroom. And then they stood up in front, uh, on the, front of the board and said, the, the examiner said, what am I standing in front of? And the kids, first graders, that's our mission statement. You know? Well, what, what is your mission in the class? And they, and they told them, you know, and what are your goals? And then what, what, they said, what am I standing in front of now? He says, well, those are our goals. Well, what are your goals? We're going to have all of the students in our class are going to be at grade level by the end of the year. I mean, these kids all chiming in. So the, they, the examiner stopped and said, okay, what does that mean? How do you know if you're at grade level? And they told them. On this test, we have to score this, and on this test, we have to score that, you know, and we have to do this, have to do that. And they knew all the criteria. And so then the, the examiner says, are those your goals or are those your teacher's goals? And this little girl says, of course they're our goals. She already knows how to read and write. <laughs> so they, they, the, the, one of the examiners goes over to the wall and says, What's this right here? This little kid's sitting in the back, hadn't said anything. He said, you, come here. What is this? This little kid says, the first grade kid said, that's a run chart. I said, well, what's a run chart? He said, it shows us how we're doing. And so how are you doing? Are you doing better or what? This little kid rolls his eyes and says, of course we're doing better. The line's going up. <laughs> you know? I mean, th they know. So it's more just a matter of actually it's probably better 
better at trying to teach them young because they're not already set they're already jaded. Or, right. Yeah, they're, <laughs> not, they're, not, they're not jaded yet. They haven't been taught that this is how the system works. And so you say, this is how we're going to run this place. Okay. And you sit down, and the first thing you do, you spend the first week of school talking about the classroom. How are we going to behave? What are the rules here? You know, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, what, what's our goal here? And the teacher comes off, we call the, we call the students co-production agents. You know, that you're, you're, we have a mutual uh, task here. Our mutual task is to meet our customers' requirements. And my job is to help you get there. And so let's talk about how we're going to do that. And it means everybody in the class is going to get to grade level. Not just some of us, everybody is going to be at grade level. And so the teacher gives the students grade, uh, uh, you know, classroom level data. You know, here, here, here's how we're doing as a class. Now, we didn't do very good on the first test, right? Because we're not supposed to. You know, the goal is to be there at the end of the year. Now, here's where, and then the, each one of the students get their own individual report showing where they are. Uh, but that's never touted around. Nobody gets a gold star. You never hand them out in rank order. You know, nobody's ever paraded around as being the role model, you know. Now, we have some students that are, that are called mentors, you know. So there'll be a math mentor, you know, that, that helps the students that are struggling in math. You know, there will be a, a reading mentor, you know, that, that you can go to if you're having a problem. A student has a problem to go. Remember they talked about how they kind of coach each other? And so there will be people that are kind of get that designation. But it's not like they run them up the flagpole as, you know, you get, this, you get the shiny star or whatever. N none of that. One of the, I think one of the most moving uh, experiences I ever had uh, was uh, at the very end. Of, I, uh, Honeywell paid half my salary so I, could, uh, cut, so I could work a whole year over in the Pinellas County Schools. And at the end of that uh, year, uh, the fifth grade class that was the math is the real that, that that's the real tough deal that's the that's the nut you have to crack in the fifth grade is those kids have got to be ready to go to middle school on math I mean, that, that's real, that's the hardest part and so we put in uh, they put in a whole new system for uh, educating the kids on math and we kind of wondered whether it's going to work or not or whatever it turns out it worked worked wonderfully and so uh, at the end of, uh, before they took the standardized test they took the standardized test in May if I remember right and in April, you know, I walked in and, and I had the preliminary results of another test that they had taken. And I walked in the classroom with, the, with these results and I said, okay, kids, here's your math results, you know. And everybody jumps up out of their chair and they all run over, let us see, let us see, let us see how we do, how we do. And so we turned it around and there were 20 questions. And on 18 of the questions, everybody got it right. 100% of the students had gotten it right. And there were two questions that, uh, that less than 100%, I think it was 90% of the students had gotten right or something about, about there, just dipped down on these two questions. And everybody's cheering and, you know, jumping up and down. Look how good we did. Oh, by the way, it also had the other four times they'd taken the test. It had the four lines and so everybody could see where they where they'd, had scored. And so then I said, and everybody's cheering and everything, I said, okay, what do you do next? And so one of the kids says, well, let's find out why we missed those last two. You know, so they went and got the manual. They wrote the two questions on the board. One kid wrote one question. One kid wrote the other question. And then they said, okay, let's find out why we missed it. And one kid raised his hand and said, I think I know why, I think I know why some people missed it. You know, because they got this number confused or what, they inverted that number or whatever the, whatever the story was. And when they took the test, the standardized test in May, 100% of the students got 100% of the questions right. You know, because they understood but see, here's the point about that, and this is why it was so moving. Not one child, not one child ever asked how he or she did. Nobody asked, didn't want to know. You know, as a class, we didn't make it on two questions. As a class, we have to figure out what to do about those last two questions. So let's get at it. Nobody wanted to know. Nobody said, who's the idiot that didn't make these last two? You know, oh, you screwed up, it's all your fault. You know, none of that. It's like, we didn't make it as a class, Let's figure out what we didn't do on those last two questions. You see? And that, and that, to me, is what education really ought to be about. It ought to be about that. Now, does that mean that there's no variance in the students? That there, some students are brighter than other students? Of course. There's natural variance in human beings. You, and to get, that, to get rid of that variance would be to remove humanity, in my opinion, you know, from, from people. But what you're saying is we're going to have the bottom bar is going to be right here. You know, and if people go over that bar, hallelujah, that's great. But we're not going to compromise on this bottom bar here at all. You're going to be at grade level or we failed as a, as a class, as a, as a school and everything else. 100% of the students at grade level. You notice how Brenda, 100%, you know, so proud that 98% of their students could be tested. The 2% that couldn't be tested are autistic. You know, and they just literally couldn't be tested. 
and 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 you know everybody's working to try to get all of those kids regardless of what their disability is you know to where they can not only be tested but they can get at grade level and let me tell you they have made some major breakthroughs uh, in uh, in ESE kids exceptional education they, they made some major breakthroughs before let me tell you what a lot of those kids were just being warehoused you know they'd bring them in in the morning keep them out of trouble until three you know cut them loose send them home and after that they had to start teaching them I mean they had to start teaching them in a major serious way you could no longer hide it if you're gonna test your kids you know, we expect them to be at grade level now remember remember when Brenda showed that data those data and they were going up like this and then they went flat you remember that one year when it went flat now the reason it went flat was because they included all the ESE kids if you took the ESE kids out that number that real line was up there okay you can't believe what celebration broke out in the district when they went flat celebration you know ha ah, we told you we told you it wasn't real you know she her scores went flat oh I mean it was a celebration everybody wanted to fail celebration isn't that sad yeah. yes to convince um, or get buy-in from all the teachers she to didn't. to get this because obviously the teachers I mean a number of them had to be there for a number of years and this is new concept to all of them or how uh, many did actually participate in this uh, when she got started uh, doing this uh, she kind of uh, laid down the law uh, you're either gonna it's either my way or the highway so more or less and in, in the Pinellas County Schools of course you got to go to prison before you can be fired uh, but you know she you know are on your way uh, you know she basically said you're gonna you're gonna do this or, or I'm, you're not gonna be my friend it took about five years to get rid of all of them we had a celebration uh, when the last one left when the last naysayer left everybody went hallelujah you know the, the ding dong the witch is gone you know I mean we, we had a big celebration I mean, everybody everybody knew who they were I mean don't, don't kid yourself in every school every teacher knows who the horrible teachers are they know and they got rid of them. you know one by one by one you know you just don't talk to them around the coffee around the coffee machine they're not your friends you don't go out to the bar with them on Friday afternoon you don't invite them over to your house on the weekend they're persona non grata and so you put that social pressure on them to get them out get them out of there and they got she got them out of there she had uh, some major turnover now it's just the opposite everybody wants in there see so you, you're coming out of school and you go to the whatever that thing is called the Sun flows Suncoast Florida Teachers Academy or whatever you know you're 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 trying to figure out a way to get in there there are teachers over there that drive all the way down US 19 through living hell you know to get from northern Pinellas County to, down there they could teach at a school right in their own neighborhood you know but they drive all the way down there just to just to get down there. Miss Bowles the teacher that those students were part of uh, you know she was forced to retire from the school district uh, la last year uh, she was forced to retire uh, it was one of the saddest days, uh, you know, one of the saddest events you've ever seen. She was forced to retire. You know, and she, did, she was so remorseful that, you know, she'd been in education her entire life. And in the last, you know, in the last five years, she'd finally gotten to be a teacher. You know, and she, and, you know, she had to, and she kind of had to walk off from it. Real loss. Major loss. Hello. Hello, are we still on? Somebody, somebody, I can't hear. Uh, hello? Okay, I can hear you now. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question whether her, uh, forced retirement was a result of some of the things that have been going on at the school what do you mean I mean because uh, you know because these people are kind of renegades that you know putting these processes in place and doing these things for the children did that have anything to factor in to her being forced to retire sure uh, the system pushes back I mean uh, you know the, uh, you you push on the system the system will always push back and it pushed back on her uh, she you now let me tell you I'll tell you Pinellas County School side of the story uh, Pinellas County School side of the story I mean I'm, I think I'm speaking fairly I wish they were here to counter me if they were here they would counter me uh, the uh, uh, you know my side of the story is is uh, well their side of the story would be this we hired her to be a principal at Azalea Elementary School we did not hire her to be on the national uh, 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 boards the national uh, educational goals panel we did not hire her uh, to go up to Washington DC to talk to Congress we did not hire her uh, you know to uh, to put on symposia around the United States uh, we you know we hired her to run this to run this elementary school now the fact that it's on autopilot 
you know, and the fact that it can run itself, and the fact that there's no reason for her to really be there uh, because the systems are all uh, in place and, and do doing so well. Her, even though her test scores are, are uh, exemplary, even though they're considered to be a role model, we don't care about that. We hired her to be uh, a principal at this, elementary, at, at this elementary school, and she's not doing that. She's out doing something else. You mix in a lot of professional jealousy into the middle of all of that, well, you, got, you got your all the prescriptions for a disaster. And so she got way too much attention. And it became not the Pinellas County Schools Initiative, it became Azalea Elementary School. You see, Pinellas County Schools, and Brenda's right, I mean, as far as being a role model school district, or, or being the leaders in what they're doing, yeah, they probably are. And that, that's, not a, that's not a statement of how great Pinellas is, that's a statement of how horrible everybody else is. You know, because Pinellas is not very far along in this thing. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what their Baldur's score would be. I, you know, they're, they're, they have applied for the Baldur's Award, and what scares me to death is that they'll win it. The, the reason they might win it is because Baldur's needs a winner. Baldur's has not had an education winner, and if they don't get one pretty soon, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole Baldur's process is going to start to look suspect. In other words, and why, why have a Baldur's Education Award if nobody can win it? And so Pinellas is, you know, head of all the other school districts. But it's not like it's advanced. I mean, it's not like it's advanced. It's not like it's a Honeywell, you know, where, you know, you've got, you know, you've got really uh, you know, systems throughout, you know. It's not like GE. It's not like, you know, Allied Signal. It's not like Motorola. You know, it's a, it's a far cry, you know, from any of that. Why, why did you base on the, when, when they were doing it, the Baldrige criteria and those systems and methodology versus any other methodologies since, versus a pure Deming methodology. They tried uh, a pure dimming methodology when this thing first got cranked up and it fell flat on its face. Uh, and the reason is, of course, for the same reason that most dimming things that where dimming's not around uh, fall flat on their face. Yes, what do you do next? You know, uh, uh, teachers, uh, principals, uh, tend to be kind of concrete sequential people. Now, uh, Brent, Brenda is an abstract random person, you know, so, I mean, if you've got to type, type people, she's abstract random, uh, you know, and abstract random people kind of deal with dimming your stuff pretty well. Uh, concrete sequential people can't deal with dimming at all. You know, you raise your hand and you say, well, Dr. Dimming, what do we do Monday morning? You know, his response is something. You know, work on something. Start somewhere. You'll take care of itself eventually. You know, and so, uh, you know, uh, concrete sequential people don't find a lot of comfort in that. Okay? And so the dimming thing fell flat on its face. People went out for their, this uh, summer thing. Uh, they got educated on dimming principles. And then they went back to work on Monday, and what do we do? Nobody knew, so nobody did anything. Everybody just went right back to what they were doing. The Baldrige stuff is perfect for people that are concrete, sequential, you know, got to have a scoring matrix, and, you know, got to have a set of criteria. You know, yeah, works fine. And so uh, that, that was the motivation for going to that. How long did it take them to figure out to use Deming versus, or to, to use Baldridge versus? Oh, I don't know. I, I would say that that was a probably uh, two, two years of lost effort. You know, that it, took, it probably took two years, maybe three, to figure out that the Deming thing just wasn't going to fly. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the other states that were involved in trying the Baldridge, mm -hmm. have they stopped yeah, that pretty, process? Yeah, and pretty much. You know, they're still going on, but the National Education Goals Panel is in serious trouble. Uh, and the reason, I'm on that, I'm on that panel, uh, the reason that it's in trouble uh, is because of funding. Uh, it, it, it did not, it, it, they had hoped that they would get a lot of funding from, uh, from various and sundry uh, businesses and all. Uh, businesses have just washed their hands of education. I mean, for the most part, uh, like, like, like uh, in 1991, uh, when we'd have a meeting, there was somebody there from Paradigm, Honeywell, Florida Power Corp, I mean, I could list them off, Raytheon, E-Systems. Sitting around the table was this who's who panel of big shots over in Pinellas. And one by one by one, they just stopped showing up, so they got rid of the advisory board, you know, because they just washed their hands of it. I mean, you, you know, in industry, when you want to do something and you recognize it's something to do, you know, you just go do it. Correct? There, you just don't go do it. I mean, you'd say, Look at the data. Look at the data, Superintendent Heinsley. Look at the data. Look at what's happened to these people when they go down to the middle school. You know? And he says, meh, no, I, just can't, I can't do anything about that. I'm sorry. You know? I mean, if you had a company that, that produced a product that everybody agrees is a bad product, right? then and you'd think, 
maybe I ought to get the R&D group together and figure out what to do about this, about the product, right? Well, somebody needs to work on, on the secondary system, right? The, the secondary ed model because they don't have that model together. Nobody's got that model together. It's not just Pinellas. I mean, nobody has the model together. And so somebody needs to get busy in the R&D lab putting that together. How long is it going to take to create that, that secondary ed model? I'd say three, four, maybe five years, uh, you know, because you're going to make some mistakes in the process. You know, so you'd think somebody would be working on that big time, right? Well, they just kind of just begun. You know? And so in 1992, 1993, 1994, you know, these people are saying, you know, Larry Spay out at the Honeywell saying, okay, what are you doing about secondary ed? <laughs> Everybody just kind of looks around the room. Well, the 21st Century Learning Center over at, uh, over at Largo High School has got this cool thing going on. Let's talk about that. That's one high school. And what about middle schools? One middle school. That was, uh, that was um, uh, Carwise Middle School. They applied for the Sterling like two or three times and, and uh, didn't quite make it. Uh, but, you know, they're up in the northern part of the county, you know, totally isolated from everybody else. You know, this, this was working on the stuff. We were all in the south part of the county, as far as I know. And so, you know, you, uh, so you have one middle school that's trying to work on it. They're working on it in isolation, pretty much. You know, you got one part of one high school that's kind of working on it. And the Largo, uh, the, the 21st century Lar Largo uh, pretty much dropped it. Uh, Barbara Thornton was the principal there. She just got tired of it and pretty much dropped it. Uh, Carwise got fed up with it, you know, because they just kind of went through the process three or four times. When Sterling came in there and said, you know, show me your systems, they didn't have any systems to show them. Why? Because there are no systems. Nobody's ever created that system. Nobody knows what that looks like. And so, and it, so you can see why the frustration, you know, I mean, it, there's just no sense of urgency. We do things here very slowly. We do things here, you know, at our own pace. You know, everything's volunteer. If you, if you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, there are no repercussions. Uh, you know, they, so people just didn't do it. Some people, I mean, they went through the motions. They, they converted the school improvement plan over into Baldridge terminology. But rather than fix, rather than make a system like what Brenda has, you know, what they did was they just took the old system and just bust Baldridge right on top of it. So do we have a goal? Yes, we have a goal. <laughs> So they, they just used the terminology, but didn't change anything fundamentally. I mean, how they educate the students, what they, how they run their classrooms, that part of the deal, in my opinion, uh, didn't change. And I don't know if anybody's cracked the model. Uh, there's a, a high school uh, in Delaware, uh, three high schools that are in a vo vo vocational technical high school district up there, the Newcastle County Votech High School District. They have three high schools. If you take the SAT scores uh, in, uh, in Delaware, you basically have the three Votech high schools of the top scores, then you have a, 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 brand, a gap, and then you have the private schools, then you have another huge gap, and you have the public high schools. Uh, the reason it turns out that those Votech high schools were the highest performing ones in the state uh, turned out that was totally accidental, uh, but it kind of went like, like this. They said, okay, who's our customer? Let's, 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 let's say I'm in auto tech. Okay? Who's my customer? Chrysler. Chrysler has a, a plant there. They're my customer. So what they did was they partnered the English teachers up with the, with the auto tech people. So if you're in auto tech, you all have the same English teachers. Make sense? So what they did was they sent the English teachers out to the Chrysler plant. And they said, what would you like our students to learn? Okay? And they handed them a shop manual. And they said, here, this is a shop manual for a Dodge Durango. If, you, if your students can read this, you know, then we'll hire them. If they can't read this, they won't. So the English teachers go back to the high school, and it's something serendipitous happened. They said, okay, okay, children, I'm your English teacher. Our job is to learn how to read this shop manual. If you can read this shop manual, when you walk out of here, you make $28.50 an hour. If you can't read the shop manual when you walk out of here, you'll make five fifty an hour and the most complicated question you'll ever ask is do you want fries with that? <laughs> now, so which is it going to be? And the students say, I think it's a good idea that we learn how to read the shop manual. So what they did was they, they dispensed with Beowulf and Shakespeare and, uh, you know, and everybody else and they started reading the Chrysler shop manual. Well, guess what, folks? 
If you can read the Chrysler Shop Manual, you can read anything on this planet. And when you take the SAT scores, guess what happens? You do really well. And so what happened was, all these Votech kids start going to college, they all start getting scholarships, etc., etc. What happened to that system? <laughs> That's right. You're exactly right. And Chrysler got really mad. It turns out that the, school, the student, I mean, I can't remember what it was, 50, 60 percent of them or something, uh, went to college on scholarships. Yeah, and so Chrysler didn't get them. That's right. You're exactly right. Chrysler was not happy. But it, it, in, it inadvertently created this uh, system. And my understanding is that system pretty much fell apart too. The superintendent of that school district got in trouble, uh, got pushed. And, uh, and left, and then it, it kind of fell apart. The system always pushes back. I was in Tarpon High, I graduated in 96, and they were trying to just piecemeal show. It was just like, just like showing people that they were trying to do things, and it was just political. Because they tried to do the block system, like, to what, like you're saying, where they match you up and whatnot with different teachers, and then you, you know, if, if one went over, then you were able to, you know, it was okay where you could just kind of go to the next one, and. You know, it's a give and take sort of thing, and they try to do some things, but it was a kind of a joke. Well, uh, you know, everybody's struggling. The, the problem is, is that what are they taking to the table? And, and in every in, in Pinellas, when the last the last time I remember hearing the story, they had they have eight high schools in Pinellas, if I remember right, and at one time six of them were in were in jeopardy of being either F or D schools. I think the, I think the vast majority of their high schools are are D uh, D schools. Um, Maybe I'm wrong about that. If I am, I'll, if I'm wrong about any of this stuff, I'll apologize. But, but my memory is that they were in big trouble. Their high schools were clearly in big trouble. I went to one of their high schools, and you, I mean, I was shocked. I mean, I was just absolutely shocked. They, they, gave, they showed me how many convicted felons that they had going to school there. It was unbelievable. Their quality improvement initiative for the year was to move the probation office from downtown to the school so that the kids wouldn't have to miss school to go uh, make their probation meeting. I mean, I, I was shocked. You know, had a whole wing of the school there for unwed mothers. I mean, I just, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And so, you know, you're in, you're in that kind of environment. What are you going to do? Well, now they're even doing enrollment systems. That was the first one to do it. Where you, you go in, you're able to get an AA degree while you're in high school, and, you know, you can sort of get out early. So if you hate the system, you can get the hell out. And that's what I did. So, yeah. Well, everybody's struggling to try to do it, but, you know, the, the problem is, is that the toolkit that they're taking with them to fix it is not, a, is not an adequate toolkit. The toolkit that they're taking with them just never has worked. M most, of, most of the people in education, my experience has been, uh, believe that the curriculum is the magic bullet. If we just had that perfect curriculum, you know, everybody would learn. So let's just keep working on the curriculum and working on the curriculum and working on the curriculum in hopes that we'll stumble across that perfect curriculum that, that helps everybody to learn. And they just keep trying, they keep going back to that well. And it just never has worked. Yeah. I have a question. Especially during this last election, education was a big issue. Mm -hmm. What I kept hearing from the education unions was that you have to pay the teachers more, you have to pay the teachers more. We heard that over and over again. And mm -hmm. then you heard about the voucher systems because they're so um, against it because it's going to take money from the public schools and so on and so forth. So why isn't anyone stepping up to the plate and, and offering a solution that deals with changing the system? Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for the last question of why somebody's not stepping up to the plate. I, I just don't have a reason. For, I, don't have an, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I have become so jaded about uh, the entire system that any answer I give you will be so cynical uh, that it will uh, it'll disturb you all. Uh, I, I just, uh, the union has never been a problem for me. I have never had a problem with the union. The union, the, I, the, the NEA has never given me a single problem. They, they have their heart in the right place as far as I know, in Pinellas especially. Uh, they, want to, they want to improve education. They have been at the table at everything that I've ever done. Uh, they've been some of our biggest supporters, Linda Bacon, and uh, there's a whole list of those people over there in Pinellas that are wonderful, wonderful people that are highly knowledgeable.
Yeah. And the, uh, I think the NEA, as far as the Pinellas County, uh, the, uh, the Classroom Teachers Association in Pinellas, I think they understand that somebody's got to fix the system, and that's going to take, uh, you know, the union's uh, cooperation. And the union is a system, and, that's, and that system is broken in very large part. You know, so somebody's got to fix that system, too. And I think they, I think they recognize that. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations uh, with uh, uh, Case, whatever his first name is, the guy that runs the, uh, the, the, the president of the NEA. And he's in almost an untenable uh, position a, as a union leader. If he comes up and, he, you know, he, I mean, I heard the guy make a speech one time where he said the union ought to, fi ought to be the people that fire teachers. You know, when there's a dysfunctional teacher that's not doing their job, it ought to be the union. It ought to be their, their colleagues that escort them to the door, not the school district. You know, we ought to be escorting people out of the profession that don't need to be in the profession. That little 1%, 2%, or 3% that just don't have any business being here. And I mean, I, you, he took it square on the chin, you know, for saying, for saying that. Uh, you know, they do not, uh, you know, my experience, nobody likes change. And teachers are not any different than everybody else. They don't like change. They want to get in that comfortable zone and just stay there. I can't give you a reason. I mean, uh, it's, it's like the, the closing the gap on socioeconomic status. In this country, if there's another agenda that's more important than that one, I wish that somebody would tell me what it is. I mean, we, we have wanted and need to close the socioeconomic gap in this country uh, so badly that it's unbelievable. And yet, nobody has, a, has an answer for how to do that. And you show them that it does that. And what do they do? The system will crush you like you can't imagine. The guy in Brazosport, Brazosport School District, superintendent, run off, left, you know, the system pushed back. He's no longer there. That's if you believe the premise that we want to get rid of a social economic. Now, there are some people in this country that do not want to get rid of social economic status. You know, and I think that if, if, if there's anything more maniacal than that, I don't know what it, what it would be. You've been patient. Fog, love them, and all this stuff. Yeah, the self-esteem deal. That, that right, deal. And different things. And I guess my question is, my high school was not perfect. And what, I guess I'm going to give my age away. I went to Brandon High when it was the only high school. But I would say overall I had a really a good experience there. And I, I wondered if you thought over the years, like in the last, say, 20 years, that education and the quality of education and the methods they use have decayed or... State this well, because I say this because a few years after I, I graduated, I went back over there to take my mom something she forgot she was teaching there. And they had security guards in the halls. And I was like, whoa, because my, when I went to school, we didn't need security guards. And just to, within a few years, they had to have guards in the halls and chains. And it, it just really blew me away. The, uh, it, I think if you go back and take a Baldridge system and lay it on top of education in 1950 or whatever. Uh, well, I'm not I didn't say you were. <laughs> Did I infer that? I hope not. Uh, I, I know better than that. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm older than you are, and believe me, I wasn't, I wasn't around for that either. Uh, but if, if, if okay, let, let, let's see. Uh, I was born in 51. I don't mind anybody knowing. I'm about to be 50 years old. Uh, and uh, when I went to school, I think if you laid it on top of, if you laid baldage on top, you know, was there a clear aim of the system? Was, was the aim of the system clear to everybody? And in, I would argue in the 1950s it was clear. Everybody knew why they were there. You were there to teach the kids that were going to go through school. You know? And the kids that weren't going to go through school, you warehouse them until you could throw them out. You know? I was, uh, I was very, we were very, uh, raised in a very poor family. Uh, you know, I went to very poor schools and I saw them weed them out. You know? they, they'd put you down in these incredibly low octane classes. Uh, you know, that had, had no substance to them. Uh, you, got into, you got into trouble, they'd expel you. Well, why would they expel you? I mean, I expelling somebody from school is the absolutely worst possible thing you can do to them academically. You know, and as a matter of fact, you pass rules that prohibit them from making up their work, so you guarantee them bad grades, so that gives you the right to flunk them, you know, for the semester, so you hold them back. The whole system was set up, like Brenda said, for that 20% that were going to make it through the system, go to college, and prosper. And I think everybody understood that that was the aim of the system. The aim of the system was to do that. It was crystal clear in everybody's mind, and they did it. And they had a method for doing that. And it, that method was absolutely crystal clear. They had processes in place for getting that done for that 20%. So this, I think the system worked. I think it built that system for what it was, worked well. Now, when, when the self-esteem stuff came on board, 
uh, basically what happened was you had social promotion. Or the idea is we can't, we can't no longer afford as a society to flunk these people out. So, but that doesn't mean educate them. You know, we're not going to educate them. We're just not going to flunk them out. And so we're going to take the warehousing concept and, and elevate that up into a, into a whole new industrial complex. You know, so that we take kids through school and we just warehouse them. Don't have the pretense of teaching them. Uh, you know, and just when they get to be seniors, you know, we, we'll cut them loose. And then we'll let society deal with them. Now, you lay that on top of the social esteem stuff, which came in, the, and social promotion stuff and self-esteem, which basically, you just whatever you do, you don't tell anybody they're doing something wrong. You know? So you say, oh, isn't that creative how you spell that word? You know, put a little smiley face on it. And, you, and, and today in America, you can be fired in many school districts for putting a frowny face uh, on, on somebody's paper or giving them an F. You can be fired. And look, at, and it, it's worked its way into college. You know, in college, you have great inflation that's completely out of control. You know, when, you know, when I was in college, what was the purpose? The purpose was to do another weeding. You know, you get, you get that first group in and, and sophomore and, 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 and freshman classes. And what's the purpose of those classes? To weed out another batch of them. You know, so you, you take the 20% into college and get rid of half of them. And so it was absolutely, you know, crystal clear. But it's, make, it's made its way into, uh, into, into the university campuses. There's a great book called in The Closing of the American Mind uh, by a guy named Bloom, uh, Alfred Bloom. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to read a great book, that's a great book. It talks about how the university system is being denigrated in exactly the same way uh, that happened in, uh, in public education. And so we're just the next step in the evolutionary ladder uh, of more of that, uh, more of that stuff kind of happening. You've been extremely patient. I'm actually probably on my second or third question, the other one's called I asked. But uh, when I came to Florida, I was shocked at how large the school districts are down here. That organized by Unmanageable, county. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see any changes when you get to areas where they're organized by city or by town? Uh, no, I find them uh, just, uh, maybe even more dysfunctional. Uh, because when you like you go to Delaware, I don't. You know, Delaware is like a little big, tiny state. I mean, that wouldn't even hardly be a county here uh, in uh, in Florida. Uh, well, in Texas, I can guarantee it wouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> In, in Texas, it would be like, I don't know what, big, one of the smallest counties. Uh, but in Delaware, you know, you have uh, 38 school districts or something like that in Delaware. I can't remember the exact number, but I mean, there's lots of these school districts. A lot of them only have three or four schools. And you talk about political. I mean, they are political. And what did we learn last time? Political equals dysfunctional. And so, you know, they're, they're politi as political as the day is long. And yeah, it's a, I, I, my experience has not been good on that. Pinellas is huge. I mean, that is a huge organization. And so what happens is, is that you, you, the way you control the district from a leadership perspective is you kind of get the, over, the, the larger echelon, the higher echelon, to kind of set the general parameters that are supposed to be done. You set rules and policies, and then you just kind of have independent contractors that, that run the schools. The, principal, the schools are referred to by the, by the district administration as so-and-so school. That's Brenda's school. That's Kathy's school. That's John's school. That's how they refer to it. You know, because it's their school. They run their school. We give them guidelines. We give them parameters. We provide them with resources. But it's their school. And that's kind of how you deal with it. And so you try to take and tell those principals who have run their schools as independent contractors for the last 20 years, and you go in there and you tell them, no, you're going to do it this way. And they go, who are you? This is my school. We'll do this one I'm ready. I mean, it's tough. It's, a very, it's very, very, very difficult to do. Believe me. I haven't walked in, in my entire life, I've walked away from very few fights. And this is a fight that I walked away from. I gave it nine years of my life, and I walked away from it. Now, when, when the high school just said, well, they didn't say anything. Uh, you, know, you don't even get a phone call back. You know, that's it for me. You know, I you know I don't, I don't mind telling you my consulting rates. I charge between twenty five hundred and three thousand dollars a day, and I'm offered to give these people one day a week of my life for five years to fix their system. Add it up. That's serious money. You know, and they don't even, they don't even have the courtesy to call back and say no. Yeah, you know, I walked away. No, if, if I thought there was a solution, I'd give it to you. I don't know of any. Now, there are some people, Brenda's one of them, uh, Jim Shipley's one, Chris Collins' one, you know, several people that come from Pamela that have all been either fired or, uh, or removed from the school district, asked to leave, 
uh, that are around the country uh, that, you know, are doing some really magnificent things. They're working with a lot of school districts, making a lot of inroads, working real hard. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that, that you, know, you remember that, that uh, random acts of improvement and aligned acts of improvement? They're just a random act of improvement. You know, I mean, in, in hindsight, I mean, I, have to, I just have to admit, you know, that all the work that I did in Pinellas was a random act. It wasn't part of the overall system. It was one of those arrows that was going off in, in a direction. That direction was pretty close to the goal, yeah. but it was just another one of the arrows and not a particularly important one. You know, I, the, the only salvation that I have from all of that is, is that other school districts around the United States have taken that and run with it. You know, I, get, I, you know, I, I know enough to know that the other school districts around have been very, very influenced by that. Miami-Dade actually uh, probably stands the best chance in Florida uh, right now doing something as uh, district wide. I mean they have they have what from what I sense really good leadership buy in and uh, they have the, they have a concerted initiative going on and my guess is you'll see some great things out of out of Miami Dade over the over the next uh, five years. Well, they had one school what forced them to do it. Uh, nothing forced them to do it. It's that they, they came they were looking for they had big problems. They had massive number of schools that that were F schools that I can't remember what it was, 30-something schools that were F schools. If they'd gotten that second F, they would have been on vouchers. Uh, one of those schools who used this, uh, this Azalea sort of model uh, went from an F to an A in one year. It you know, went from an F to an A in one year, all because they just got their act together. And so, you know, I think the Miami, got, Miami Day got bad enough that, that, you know, my sense of it is is that they, they, saw, they see the opportunity in all of this. And not only that, but you lay, a, you lay enough myth on top of it, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you tell people that you're doing things, even though you're not really doing them, and they, they believe that so strongly, you know, you see that then they believe it's true. It's like if you come to Pinellas and you say, I, wanna, I, heard, I heard about this, uh, this, uh, this balder stuff you guys are doing, can you take me around and show me? Well, I'll tell you where they'll take you. They'll take you over to Carwise Middle School, they'll take you to Rawlings Elementary School, and they'll take you to Azalea Elementary School. There's a couple other isolated places that they'll take you, but they're not going to let you go through the whole school. And the reason is because that's all they got to show. They're not going to take you. They're not just going to. They're just not going to take a phone book out and let you take a pen. <laughs> you know, oh, I want to go see that school. They're not going to do that because they don't have that to show. But so what you do is you go to Miami Dade and you say, Oh, we're doing this everywhere. You know, this is working great. You know, we're implementing this school district wide. You know, and you keep saying that, and then somebody believes it. And then what they do, even though they, even though it may not be entirely true, it's somewhat true. And they would argue with, if they were here, they'd get very defensive about that. And they'd say, well, we are implementing it. We're doing it as fast as we can. We're doing what we can, you know, get off our back. Uh, but, you know, uh, Miami Dade doesn't know that. And so somebody tells Miami Dade, well, they've done this up in Pinellas. You know, they've done it district wide. You know, how come we aren't doing it district wide? And they start to implement it. But, of course, they're going to hit the same roadblock that, that Pinellas hit, which is the secondary ed model. Nobody can crack it. You know, they'll have, a, they'll have an elementary school go from an F school to an A school. Why? Because there's a model. There's a model about how you do that. It's, it's easily implemented. Now that somebody's been through it, you can copy it, just adapt it, mo make minor modifications to it, and you can make that work inside your school, uh, you know, piece of cake. But nobody's got that secondary ed model. You're not going to have an F high school go to an A high school in a year because there is no model for how to do that. Won't happen not, a, not, not, not anytime soon. Not until somebody cracks it. Somebody's got to crack it, and I don't know anybody that's working on it. I mean, there's some people working on it in Pinellas, but they're working on it at snail space. Those, uh, those states that she listed, they're all going through this? They're not going after the state? Well, now, what's, what's gone on is they all got started, you see. Uh, but but when, when there was no funding for it, uh, you know, what, what do you do next? And it got resistance. I mean, it, uh, uh, the system started pushing back. And when the system pushed back, you know, what, what are these people going to do? Now, New Mexico has done an outstanding job, and Texas has done an outstanding job. But you ought to also know that uh, former Governor Bush, our illustrious president, uh, thinks that Baldridge is a so-so deal and not really particularly interested in it, and his brother is even less interested in it. They just don't see that as being the, uh, being the deal. Uh, the, the guys in Texas that are running the, the, the education process in Texas, I mean, I've gone down there and made addresses to them, you know, and I've, you know, gone to the legislators in Texas and talk to them about what we've done uh, over here, my views on things. And I can tell you the Governor Bush of Texas uh, did virtually nothing, as far as I know, uh, to help implement uh, the quality stuff that went on there. I mean, he paid it lip service in the same way uh, that the people here give it lip service. Uh, Governor Brogan, uh, Lieutenant Governor Brogan, 
uh, here, who was the commissioner of the Department of Education for a while, he knows quality speak. That is, uh, he can make a speech as good as anybody, uh, you know, that has quality jargon laid and all in it, but he doesn't know how to implement it. He, he didn't do anything at the Department of Education to implement quality. Uh, the notion that, the, that, you know, uh, that, he, that he did that is, 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 is nuts. You know, the, the notion that Bush thinks that the Governor Sterling process is the way to go about it, is, that's also nuts. He doesn't, I don't think he buys into it. He doesn't come to the conferences. He doesn't make the addresses over there. You know? I, I just don't believe that there's a buy-in at the, at the governor's level here for how to do it. If the governor walked over to the Department of Education and said, Sterling's the way to go, this is how I want you to do it, and I want this implemented in the Department of Education, it'd be done tomorrow morning. I mean, they'd get working on it. But there's nobody going to do that. There's nobody going to do that. There's not a soul up there uh, that's interested in that that I know of. If you know somebody, you know, have them give me a call. I'd love to work with them. But nobody that I know of. Uh, there's been several people, I, you know, I could mention names, at the Department of Education that tried it and the system pushed back on them. They always have two or three people at the Sterling Conference every year kind of in awe and amazement. Wow, this is cool. Then they go home. My question is, what is their argument? When you show data and you show that they're improving, what is the argument to not actually implement it? Uh, if, you, if you're proving that Well, that the, the, the most common argument that I hear is we are. Yeah, we do that at our school. Oh, you do? Show me how you do this. We have goals. Let me show you what my goals are. You know, and they'll show you what their goals are. You ask their students, you know, are there students, uh, you know, these energized learners like these kids are? Nothing even similar. They just took the old system and put Baldridge jargon on top of what they were already doing. They didn't change a single thing. It's like the number of suspensions. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, here again, chicken efficiency, right? Remember the chicken efficiency stuff? No? Well, you got chicken efficiency stuff going on over there in Pinellas, just like you do everywhere else. Now, there's one, one of the things you're judged uh, as, if you're a principal, one of the variables that they look at is the number of, a number of suspensions uh, and referrals. Okay, so you, know, you get this index of numbers right, about this. Well, there's one school over there that has about the same, you know, a little bit better uh, socioeconomic status rating as Azalea, and I was looking for a benchmark, and they have zero. No referrals and no suspensions at their school, and and they're and they're held up as and, and uh, you know as the role model you know for the uh, for the district about referrals and suspensions none absolutely none. You know, so I go over there to the school one day, and I sit down in the lobby, and the receptionist walks over and said to this school. Receptionist walks over and says, "Can I help you?" And I said, "No." no. She said, "Well, what do you need?" And I said, "Nothing. I just want to sit here." Well, you can't just sit here. Why? Isn't isn't this a, isn't this a you know a public public you know public building? Yes, but you can't just sit here. And I said, well, I just want to. I just. She said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I just want to sit here, and I just want to observe some things. And she said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm I'm a college professor out at USF, and I just want to sit here and observe some things. Is that okay? No, you can't do that. So she goes get the school resource officer, the cop. You know, he comes in. You know, what do you want? And I said, I just want to sit here. You know, can't I just sit here? You know, so they get on the telephone. They call downtown to find out. They're talking to the lawyers about whether they can have me arrested or not. You know, for sitting in the in the in the lobby of the principal's office. Well, I'd been there about 15 minutes, and they're on the phone trying to figure out what to do about me. They got five or six people in the office all pointing at me. And then this the teacher, son bragging this kid in there, has got got his ear, you know, this way, drags him up to the desk and says, and. Uh, and uh, says, I want, I want him out of here for three days. Get him out of here for three days. You know, this is what he did, whatever. And so the, the associate assistant principal or whatever, you know, pulls the kid in there and calls the kid's parents in and checks him out for three days as being sick or absent or whatever, checks him out. So the kid's checked out. See? But he wasn't suspended. <laughs> Do you see? That's right. You got to be careful what you measure because that's what you're going to get. See, the kid wasn't suspended. No, no, no. The parents checked the kid out. See? And that, that, that's the kind of Mickey Mouse stuff that you. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't say that. Um, that's kind of mystic. That's the kind of stuff that that you that that, that I that I see going on. It's trademark copyright. Are you allowed to sit there anymore? I'm sorry? Are you allowed to sit there in the morning in the lobby or are you actually just left? No, I just left. 
they, they said, uh, and so I said, uh, I walked in their office where the big discussion was going on about me, and I said, I got what I needed, I'll be leaving now. And they said, well, what did you need? And I said, well, and I looked at the principal, who, the principal kept looking at me like, I think I know that guy. I think I know that guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know that guy. And I said, when you told the school superintendent that you had no suspensions and no referrals, I knew you were lying, and I just wanted to stay here until, you, until I saw somebody that got suspended. And this guy right over here, whose parents just checked him out, is suspended, right? And I said, but you're not going to call that a suspension, are you? And he's busted. He knew he was busted. And so I went, I went down, and they play all kinds of games. You know, you, you, you know here again, chicken efficiency. You know, when I first got over there, they had, okay, here's your test score. You know, for the school, right? You know, test scores, those are important, right? Okay? So I, I told the, 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 the associate superintendent, Bob Pasco, I said, why don't you put this column over there, which is percented, percent tested? Okay? He said, well, why would I do that? And I said, why don't you just find out? I said, you don't know. Why don't you find out? He says, okay. So he said, do you think something's up? And I said, no, oh, I know something's up. <laughs> yeah, but just, just find out. And so he did. So they created that column. And you know what was happening? These kids that they knew they were going to do bad on the test, they sent them on a field trip. Oh, yeah. I mean, they didn't, they didn't test them. They sent them on a field trip. Hey, you know, here, go take a field trip. You know, some of the schools, this, this number was down in the 40s. I thought I was from a cool school. We went out all the time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you were gone. <laughs> Now you know the truth. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Other comments? I'm sorry. As you can tell, I'm pretty jaded about it. You, you have to take everything I say in discount. What happened in Pinella sounded like it was, you know, a, a, a crack in the ice to, to get things started. You know, a seed was planted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's frustrating that, that it had such potential and didn't go anywhere. But, you know, well, it's still going somewhere. Don't get the idea that it hasn't well, gone anywhere. I didn't copies, say that. You know, how many copies of their application had been made, and now you're seeing it show up in other states and other districts. I mean, it's it's still a you know, frustratingly slow step toward continual improvement, but your goal or the goal of what they're doing is still to get, you know, I guess, you know, better taught kids. The injection of the virus. Well, you know, take Hillsboro, for example. Uh, in 1990, 91, right through there, uh, before Pinellas got their deal started, uh, I was uh, uh, on this uh, thing called the Tampa Bay Quality Management Network. Okay? And this was a collection of all the companies locally that were in Pinellas and Hillsboro uh, that were involved in, in quality management initiatives. And so all the quality people at those companies would meet together to try to figure out what to do at work. I mean, it was a cool deal. Uh, we'd have, I don't know, 50, 60 people you know, show up uh, at these day-long meetings. Uh, to talk about, and, you know, we go through uh, somebody's uh, plant, you know, and, and visit there and look at their quality stuff and all this. I mean, it was, it was a good deal. And so we, the executive board of that thing met one time and said, well, why, don't, why aren't we doing this in schools? And, uh, and somebody said, well, you know, why don't we go offer our services? You know, so I was elected, you know, to, uh, I guess because I don't have anything to do, better to do all day. Uh, you know, I was elected to go make a, a, a pitch, you know, at the school district. So I made a, a a, uh, uh, an appointment with uh, Dr. Sickles, uh, who was the, the head of the school board at the time, and I told him that we were very interested as a group in providing, you know, the business contacts and expertise in the business community, uh, you know, for fixing education, that we thought it was one of the tickets, that Deming was working on education, blah, 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 you know, this is going to be a, you know, and, and uh, it was one of the most surreal things I've ever been through. I mean, he didn't say a word, and then he got up and walked over and put his hand on my shoulder and kind of raised me out of my chair and turned me around and walked me to the door and he said, I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying no. <laughs> and that was that. Uh, the, the principal uh, at, ironically, Sickles High School, uh, my understanding, I'm speaking second and third hand here, I don't know if this is tr story is true or not, but was a Deming person, believed in Deming's philosophy, you know, and when they opened up the high school, they began a Deming kind of educational process for the teachers, and he got run off. He, and he was uh, promoted to a job downtown to get him out of the high school. System pushed back. You know, you, you, you just, you can't, you know, you, 
you, you, you just can't work in these isolated parts of the system uh, and, 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 and change it. You, you, can, you can be a virus that infects it, mm -hmm. and you just have to hope at some point you get leadership you know, that will let it happen. Yeah, you infect it with a little heresy, let it grow a little while, and you, know. you hope. You know, you hope. You know, and my hope is that it will continue to grow. You know, that is my hope. You know, and I, I really hope that Brenda uh, and Jim Shipley and Chris Collins and, and all, all of those people, you know, Marilyn Caldwell and all those people that I've spent a huge chunk of my life with over there and, and I, you know, I value greatly. I hope that those people will continue to do this uh, wherever they are and, and whatever they're doing. And I hope the people over at the Pinellas Quality Academy, you know, continue to, to move this thing forward as best they possibly can. But I can tell you that changing that education system is an uphill battle deluxe. I mean, it's, it's the hardest battle I think I ever, I, was, I had no idea what I was up against. None at all. Would you be interested in doing this in uh, Louisiana where you're going? No, I'm dropping it. I, I got better things to do with my life. <laughs> I, got, I got other fish to fry. That, that's, a, that's a Louisiana term. Other crawfish to pluck, or whatever it is that you do with those things. Boil. Uh, no, I'm uh, no, I'm 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 going to do everything I I have done everything I can to not let my name be associated with it. Uh, one of the things that I learned early on is, is that when you tell people that a college professor has been involved in it, they dial out. You know, as soon as you tell an educator uh, that that a college professor helped in uh, what was going on at Azalea. They say, oh, well, I don't have a college professor, therefore I can't do it, you see. And so I've you know, given explicit instructions to Brenda and everybody else that works at Azalea that my name is to never be mentioned. Uh, I don't want any credit for it. I don't want to be involved in, because as soon as people know that I've been involved, then all of a sudden, like in Pinellas, I've heard this a dozen, dozens of times. Oh, well, if he'd come help me, I could fix my school too. You see, it wasn't Brenda. It wasn't those teachers. It was me. You know, so I mean, I, I became a negative uh, factor in the deal when, in fact, it wasn't me that did uh, hardly any of that stuff. I mean, it was mostly them. I gave them some guidance, sure. I mean, I helped. I was there, but but it was them. It was those teachers that, that worked hard on it. They were the ones that hung around after school every day and, and met on Saturdays and, and worked hard to, to fix what they're doing. It wasn't me. But, the, but that wasn't the story that got out. See, the story, the excuse became, you know, you know no, but I'm, no, I've, I've just, uh, uh, who was, I think I mentioned that before, but I think it was, wasn't it Patton or who was it that said, you know, you, uh, wars are won and lost by choosing battles, not by fighting them. You know, and that's not a battle I'm going to fight. I'm, I've had it with that battle. You became a negative scapegoat. I'm sorry? You became a negative scapegoat. Uh, I, I became a scapegoat. I became, no, I don't think I'm a scapegoat. I just think I became an irritant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I'd ask, I would ask really challenging questions. You know, like, okay, let's, let's take this one. Let's say that 3,000 students a year leave Pinellas County Schools with a certificate of attendance rather than, rather than a high school diploma, okay? So they're sentenced to a life of poverty, uh, desperation. More than likely, they'll, be, they'll become criminals and wind up in our criminal justice system because that's what we do with them these days, right? Yeah. So how many of those children are we, you willing to sacrifice before you get serious? You know? If it's a year, that's, that's 3,000. I mean, if it's three years, that's 9,000, you know? If it's nine years, that's 27,000. Know, how many kids is it worth? How many kids are you willing to put through the meat grinder you know, before, before you do something, before you get serious? I mean, how many years is it before you go down to Azalea Middle School and say, you will do this? And if you won't do this, I'll get somebody in here who will. You know, we're going to create this secondary model, and you're going to be the place that does it, and if you don't want to do it, I'll get somebody in here who will. You know, and we're going to have these kids start from kindergarten and work their way through. You know, and that, yeah, and you don't have an option. So when are, you, when are you willing to do that? Is it 3,000 kids? Is it 6,000 kids? Is it 9,000 kids? Is it 27,000 kids? How many kids is it worth? Give me the number. Yeah, well, you don't become very popular when you say things like that. You know, what they're interested in doing is telling everybody we're the most wonderful school district in the world. You know, we have the top scores. Their, their scores are dropping, you know. You, the, the, the last batch of uh, standardized test scores, Hillsborough passed on them almost everything. Looked to me like, looked to me like Pinellas got knocked out of the top big time. You know? So you, you, know, you say, well, okay, well, then they, what do they say about that? Oh, well, Hillsborough's different than we are. Hillsborough's got a different community, different income levels, different whatever, different population, you know. You can't compare our scores to theirs. Well, you do when it's convenient, 
You know, when you're doing better than they are, you certainly run them up the flagpole. You know, when you start doing worse than you do, then all of a sudden you got an excuse. You know, they, they want people that are around that, that, are, that, are, that are good corporate citizens, that, that tell the party line, that don't say anything negative about them. That's what they want. It's very politically incorrect in any school district in this country to say anything that resembles being negative. And if you do, you're on your way out. You know, so I challenge them. I, but, but you know what, what kind of amazes me? I challenge them right from the beginning. I mean, can you imagine me being in an environment where I don't challenge people? It's not in my nature. But it, be, it became very politically incorrect for me to do that uh, later on. But so, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm persona non grata. How about much. the university? Did the university educational <laughs> department <a> have interest? <laughs> not, a, not a bit. Uh, the College of Education, they have one person in the College of Education here that, as far as I know, I'm just, I have very incomplete and anecdotal information. Uh, but the, uh, there's one person over there that does this Baldrige type stuff, but she's got her kind of own agenda. Uh, I've had uh, uh, several meetings with the, the uh, uh, with the, the um, uh, dean of the, of the college uh, in education, and my sense is is that they're not interested in any way, form, or fashion in what I'm doing. Uh, they don't want me. I've never been invited to talk to anybody over there. I've never been invited to speak to anybody over there. Uh, you know, I, they're not. They're not interested, as far as I know. You couldn't prove it by me. Now they know I'm involved. You know, there's a lot of people that know I'm involved, and. Uh, there's a you know, there's several uh, USF a uh, couple of USF professors that were working on curriculum related issues down at Rawlings and and I have great respect for those people and uh, they know what they know what I was up to but I'm from the College of Business you know what do I have to offer hmm? they, they they just seem I stay out as far as I know I mean I've, I I can't tell you I'm about to leave so I guess I'll never find out so they don't need information about changing the system within the organization which it would be the education I don't think I don't think that they really understand and, and 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 here again you have to understand that these these principles are so used to having edicts sent down and you're supposed to implement the edict you know this is how you're supposed to implement the edict and you walk through the and you check the box I mean they're not leaders they're managers you see the distinction between a leader and a manager they're managers. They manage the system. You know, if you if you go get uh, an EDD uh, in, in ed leadership, the primary thing you learn is how to stay out of jail. You know, you pay for this out of this fund, and you pay that out of that fund, and you do this, and this is the state law on this, and this is how you have you have to fill out these IEPs and AEPs and EDPs and da da da. You know, I mean, you, they teach you how to how to fill you know how to stay out of jail. I mean, that's, that's who becomes a principal, or these people that understand that this is what you're supposed to do. They're not leaders. The, the only ones that, become, that, are, that resemble leaders to me are the football coaches. The football coaches that kind of get promoted uh, up into, uh, into principal's jobs are actually some of the best principals I've run into as far as just being leaders. The problem is, is that in their toolkit, all they got is screaming and yelling and, <laughs> and, 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 and T-shirts and ribbons, you know? I mean, they... they they, they, they don't have in their toolkit what they, what they need to, to take that leadership and put it into a cohesive system. But they're still some of the best leaders as far as being a leader goes. But it's not that they don't understand and it's not that they don't want to improve education. Don't get the idea that, there's, that these people are you know, maniacal and don't want to help kids and don't want to improve education. They all want to do it. It's just that what's in their toolkit. You know, Brenda's toolkit, I'll put up against anybody in industry's toolkit. She knows quality as good as anybody you'll run into in industry. So she's got a toolkit that is a good, bona fide, valid toolkit that will work. You, you could hire her to run anything you wanted, wanted to run, and she could figure out a way to run it. But you go to these other principals, and they don't have that in their toolkit. You know, so it's like she said, who's your customer? You, know, you have to start off by saying, who do we satisfy here? Who's the customer? You know? Or what are the parents? Are the parents customers? Are the parents suppliers? <laughs> Where do they fit? Well, let me tell you something. That's not an easy answer. If you're if you're in the country club, your parents are your customer because their requirements so supersede the school district that they're almost the, the school district's irrelevant. In the country club, the parents want their kids to go to some Ivy League school. They want them to have a 1500 SAT score. And believe me, the school district that is that is 
light years higher than the school district's goals are. So who do you embrace as your customer if you're in the country club? The parents. They're your customer. Why? Because they got the highest set of requirements. Well, if you're at Azalea, are the parents your customers? No. Are you kidding? They're your enemy to a great extent. <laughs> I mean, most of their parents down there, they don't have an education. Let me tell you, I stood in, I stood in the lobby you know, with, with this guy over at Rawlings. This guy walks in, and we, we sent these assignments home with the kids, and we wanted, them, wanted the kids reading at home and stuff like this. This guy shows up one day, 7.30 in the morning. I'm one of the only people there. He walks in. He says, you work here? And I said, well, not really, but I'll be glad to help you if I can. He says, I want to know what the deal is. I don't know how to read. My wife, she don't know how to read. And I got, I'm doing just fine. I got a job. She's got a job. We got food on the table. You know, I want to know what you people want. I pay tax money so you people teach my kid. I don't want my kid coming home and having me teach them. That's your job. And by the way, are you saying I ain't good enough? Are you saying that my kid needs to be better than me? I said, well, yes, sir. Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. You know, we want your kid to learn to read, and we want your kid to do well in school. We want your kid to have a better life than you've got. Don't you want that for your child? Well, I think I'm doing just fine. And I said, well, maybe you're doing just fine in your book, but in our book, you're not. You're not doing fine. And by the way, you know, we have this after-hours program that we can put you in so that you can learn how to read, you know, so that you can help your kid read. Don't you think you want to do that? Well, I got in this big argument with him. You know? <laughs> Now, that's your customer? Do you think that's your customer? That's not your customer. As far as I'm concerned, they're a supplier. And what do you do with your suppliers? You set the requirements. You see, you set the requirements on the customers, on your suppliers. The customers set the requirements on you. And so every school has to answer those questions, and every school is going to have a different answer. There's not a uniform answer to that. Who's your customer? And they don't want to deal with it. That's been my experience. You know? And it's like when they started making copies of that Azalea application and sending it out to everybody. I got really worried about that because that model doesn't fit every school. As a matter of fact, that, school only, that model only fits a school. Rawlings Elementary School won the Sterling Award, and they're located on 66 and 66. That's how I remember their address over in Pinellas. Azalea is three miles from there, roughly, probably as the, as the crow flies, on 22nd, Street, 22nd Avenue, and 74th Street or something like that, okay? Three miles apart. Now, after I helped Rawlings, Brenda walked up to me and said, would you write our Sterling application? We want to go for Sterling. And I said, sure. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, this is going to take 30 seconds. What? I just do a word change, right? You just change Rawlings to Azalea. You turn in the application, right? Change the numbers. This is going to be a piece of cake. Let me tell you, those two schools have got absolutely nothing in common with each other except that they're both in the Pinellas County School District. That's it. Those two applications are as different as night and day. There is not a, there's not a single word, Harley, uh, in common between them. I had to completely rewrite uh, Zelia's application from scratch because what they do at that school doesn't have anything to do with what goes on at Rollins. And they're both outstanding schools located three miles from each other with almost exactly the same population of students. And yet, they have completely different schools. Why? Because they serve different communities. They got different standards. They got different focus. Uh, you know, you know Rawlings, Rawlings is a, a reading uh, and, and writing uh, uh, demonstration school, writing demonstration school. And, and so they focus on writing there. Now, over to Zelia, writing is just one of the things that we do here. It's not a particularly, it's just one of the important things that we do here. And so you, know, you have a completely different focus in the school. You can't, you, so there, there, there aren't, there, you know, there's, there's no easy answer to these things. And my experience has been that they just don't want to wrestle with that. You know? Because why? It's not easy. If you're in a high school, if you're in a high school, I mean, I, I kind of got to thinking about the secondary ed model when I kind of volunteered to crack it, you know. And you, you get to thinking, who's your customer in a high school? You think business is one of them? Sure. College. Colleges? Who do you think's got the highest standards? Well, I say the businesses. I mean, but see, how can you go forward in secondary ed until you know the answer to that question? You know, I tell you what, I bet you Honeywell's requirements for hiring somebody with a high school diploma are much higher than, uh, than USF's interest standards. Just be a guess on my part, because I, you know, who knows? You know, who knows? 
And so what, you know, what's the purpose of the high school? Who are you trying to satisfy? How are you trying to satisfy? You know, in Florida, you give the FCAT in the 10th grade. That's the last time they take the FCAT. Okay? So what about, what about your junior year? What about your senior year? So what's the measure? Is it the SAT? What percentage of the students take the SAT? I don't know. I can guarantee you one thing, it's not 100%. So if you're not measuring the SAT, you're not measuring the FCAT, you know, what's, the out, what's the output of, the, of your junior or senior year? I mean, how can, you, how can you have an education system that works when you don't even know the answer to the most fundamental question? Yeah? And that's what I was willing to work on. But they're not willing. We have enough, enough cynicism? I'm not, even, I'm not saying that I've got the answers. I'm not saying that I'm a, uh, you know, that you know, having me over there would, would solve anything. All I can tell you is I was willing to work on it. And I was willing to work on it with anybody willing to work with me on it. You know, but, you know, they're just... So the principal no. problem would be lack of leadership and laziness? Uh, I, I wouldn't... Because uh, it's something, I mean, it's something you would use now when everybody, everybody's going to lean on that. No, well, I mean, but who's, 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 back, but. But who's, who's the leadership? You, you tell me who the leadership is. Is it the school board? They're elected officials. You know, their job is to get reelected. You know? Is it the superintendent? The superintendent's got a whole uh, menagerie of people uh, between the superintendent and the principal in the school. I mean, you got the cabinet, and then you got all the CNI leaders, curriculum and instruction leaders, and you got, you know, the, I mean, there's, there's a whole host of departments, you know. Between between the superintendent and the and the uh, you know and the principal, much less a student. What about the DOE, you know, Department of Education? The superintendent is very concerned about the Department of Education. The superintendent has to be very concerned about those people. You violate their rules, they cut your checkbook. You know they can cost you a couple of million bucks just by sneezing. You don't follow the rules. You don't turn in the paperwork. You don't get what does you know. You don't measure what they say to measure. You know. You start losing millions of dollars. And whether you can gain or lose literally millions of dollars, depending on how you play the game with the educational bureaucrats, the Washington ones and the Tallahassee ones. And their curriculum as well, correct? And you have to play the curric curriculum game. I mean, there's approved curriculum and non-approved curriculum. You, you can't violate the approved curriculum. And there's all these rules. You know, and so, you know, who serves who? You know, you tell me. See, so it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy. You can't, you can't just go back and say, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a lack of leadership. Yes, I would agree it's a lack of leadership. But where? Where do you want to start? You want to start with the governor? You want to start with the president? You want to start with the DOE in Washington? You want to start with the DOE in Tallahassee? Where do you want to start? Uh, <coughs> I, agree, I grant you it's a leadership problem. But I don't, I'm not exactly sure whose leadership. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. If, if you're, you know, if, if I were the superintendent of schools, and we can all be thankful when we go home tonight that I'm not, uh, but, you know, if, if I were, I'd, I'd, I'd dig a moat around the school district, and I'd say, uh, you know, my job is to protect you from the incoming mortars that are being fired from Tallahassee, you know, and I'll do what I can to protect you, but this is what we're going to do inside the school district. You know, this is, this is going to be how we run the school district, you know, and, you know, principal over here at this school, you have no choice. If you don't want to do it, get out. I'm gonna get somebody else in here who will. You know, this is not optional anymore. You know, I'm gonna have a system that where kids can start from K to 12 and go through this process. You know, and if you're in my way, you're not my friend. You know, and I'd I'd, I'd become real nasty. In the same way that in the same way that you know, and believe me, you can do involuntary transfers. You can you can tote people in and out of schools. You can transfer people, and you know, it, it would only take two or three of those up the flagpole before everybody get the message. But they're not going to do that. You know, the superintendent's job is a political job. You make somebody mad, they'll get you. They will get you. Superintendent's uh, lifespan, you know, in, in, the, in their role, not very long. Yeah? And the ones that survive, survive by getting along. You learn how to get along with everybody. Otherwise, you don't survive. University presidents, same way. A lot of people are in that position. So is it a leadership problem? Yeah, it's probably a leadership problem, but it's a system that surrounds those leaders. They're not bad people. They're great people. They want to help kids. They want to do what's right. Sure. 
but they're caught in a system that's done, very conducive to getting that done. My understanding on Deming is, you know, and I, I, I've been told that this is incorrect, but I've, I haven't got anybody to give me any proof that it's incorrect. I was told that the NEA and several other organizations invited Deming to go to New York City to talk about how to improve education. Uh, the meeting started at 9 o'clock, and at 9 o'clock Deming started the meeting by saying, what is the aim of education? What is the aim of education? And my understanding was that he walked out at 11.30, didn't say another word, and then decided he didn't want to be involved in it because nobody could tell him what the aim of education was. And if you can't agree on what the aim of education is, how are you possibly going to fix anything? And that was the end of the road for him with education. He walked away. How many, thing, how many, how many things do you think he walked away from? No, well, he'd have educators show up at his seminars or whatever. They paid, they paid admission. You know. But, you know, take a Deming success story in education, and I'll show you one that fell apart. Uh, the one up in Alaska uh, that was, to that was, was touted uh, uh, by all these people as being the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Mount, I can't remember the name of it, uh, up in Alaska, principal left, thing fell apart. You know. Gone. Uh, one of the high schools in New York City uh, did a dimming thing, system pushed on that guy, he left, gone. The system improvements that seem to go into place don't seem to be self-sustaining in those conditions. You said the system pushed back. I see that as being like, okay, you, know, you, you, you raise the bar, and those below the bar don't like it, so you get like yanked back a little bit. The systems themselves, why, why should they fall apart instead of at least having some self-sustainability? Uh, remember we talked earlier about, you know, you, you got the organization and, uh, you know, you got all these different parts of the organization and, you know, in here, wherever. And that the way these things start is they start as a little virus over here in one part of the organization and then they infect another part of the organization, then they infect another part of the organization. Then finally somebody up here notices it, you know, and then they take credit for it. You know, they show up at the meetings to take credit for all these wonderful things that are going on. And then these people over here kind of get the political message that really I ought to do this because if I don't do that, you know. So it kind of swirls around in the organization, walks it to the top, and then swirls around. And that's kind of how it, it migrates its way out through organizations. You know, I mean, I can show you lots of examples of where this has worked. Honeywell or, you know, wherever. It doesn't start in, uh, you know, corporate headquarters by the, you know, the you know, the CEO doesn't go to a Deming conference and find, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, see the see the light and go back and implement it. It doesn't work that way. Well, in public education, you know, what happened, as far as I can tell, you know, is is that you know you 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 set up the system, you know, and you have your little prototype over here that gets started. This is your Azalea and your Rawlings thing, uh, and then you would hope that it would that it would start spreading you know, around to other parts of the organization. And uh, it, it just hasn't. I mean, it, it's, it's done it somewhat, but it's been so slow and so haphazard. And you, know, you guys know as well as I do that if you can't do these things haphazard, they can't be done anecdotally. They can't be done, you know, in, in piecemeal fashion. And so, every, you know, I, don't, I can't tell you how many companies and, I mean, how many uh, uh, schools have been to Azalea with film crews from all over the world. You know, to film what's going on. They especially come during the winter months. Um, but, you know, they, they've been from uh, all over the country, all over the world, uh, you know, to film what's going on at Azalea. And they, they, they run, it's like, a, it's like a site tour thing, tour bus that goes, goes through the school to see what's going on. As a matter of fact, they had to get that under control and put a process around it because they had so many visitors. Uh, well, you know, everybody comes over there and sees it, and then they go back to work. But they're not willing to put the five, six years that, that, that Brenda put in you know, to making that work in their school. And they're not willing to go back to ground zero and start asking the real fundamental questions. Now, the places where they are doing that, North Carolina, you know, they did it right. New Mexico, they did it right. In Texas, smattering of places here and there, you know, sort of did it right. But, you know, my experience has been that it just hasn't worked that way. And when, you, when I talk to my colleagues and my friends who are uh, involved in doing this stuff, you know, they tell me, oh, it's working really well in this particular school district in Indiana. You know, why? Because the superintendent really bought in. And the superintendent comes to all the meetings and the union's there and everybody's working on it. And so there's these little infections that are still going on. But, you know, statewide systems, 
North Carolina, yes, Governor Hunt got behind the deal. He got everybody at the table. Everybody started working on it. And my sense of it is it's been a pretty uh, good success there. But Maryland, my understanding is they got started on it, spittered, sputtered, and now it's kind of falling apart. And here again, you know, the National Alliance of Business was hoping that they'd have a lot of money come into this, into this, uh, into this program, uh, the National Education Goals Panel, that they'd be getting funding, and the funding didn't materialize. And it didn't materialize, in my personal opinion, in very large part, because the industry just kind of washed their hands of it. In other words, we've been there, we've done that, and these guys aren't playing the game. I mean, I stuck on for five years after everybody else in the industry part of the thing walked out. We couldn't get them to come to a meeting. The advisory board was nobody but me and people that worked in Pinellas County Schools is, is finally where it kind of wound up. Nobody would come. If they came, they, they would, we'd always, they'd always walk out and they'd always say things like, Jerry, what did we just do? And I said, well, we just had show and tell. Did we make a decision? No. Why did I not go to work this morning? I guess so you could come witness show and tell. We didn't make a decision. So why am I on an advisory board if we don't make a decision? Yeah, I can't give you a good answer for that. I put 136,000 miles on my car in, uh, over a period of four years. And a big piece of those was driving back and forth to Pinellas County. Didn't get a penny. All pro bono. A Latin term meaning stupid. <laughs> Any other comments? I'm very proud of those students over there, though. I can't tell you how proud I am of those students. And I wish that what had happened there had been more successful, and I wish it had been more widespread, and I wish the dissemination of all this stuff had been a lot better, and I wish the prospects were brighter than what I am uh, giving you tonight. But uh, I'm just giving you my view of what it is, uh, you know, as jaded as that may be. Oh, Josephine, uh, in the in the in the uh, in the in the in the videotape, remember Josephine from the class was reading from her her thing. Uh, I'm so proud of her. I mean, she uh, you know, she's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful kid. Has done some really wonderful stuff. Uh, got to go to Washington D.C. with her to uh, uh, make a presentation and punch a bunch of governors and legislators and people and. Uh, and uh, you know, she just uh, that 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 child has an unbelievably bright future, and and she comes from a from a background that uh, guaranteed her anything but a bright future, and she's going to do very 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 wonderful in this world. And I think you kind of sometimes have to count your successes, uh, you know, kind of one. Uh, sometimes you just count them one at a time, and she's certainly one of them. Uh, all those kids over there. I mean, I miss those kids. You know, being able to to see those kids in, in charge of their learning and and excited to be at school and sad to go home in the afternoons and all of that. Yeah, I miss a lot of that. And uh, I guess I'm probably bitter and jaded uh, as much as anything else because I know it was possible. Uh, and then I, I just know because of the establishment that surrounds them uh, that it's just probably not going to happen. You know, I guess that's the sadder part of the deal. Anyway, excuse my negativity. Anything else? Have a happy fourth. <laughs>